myself uh, and uh, also Chris Matz and Olaf Maasen. Uh, I come from an oil and gas background. Oil and gas has a lot of uncertainty. Uh, Chris and Olaf have a lot of experience in the financial sector and they've done a lot of work in, in uh, understanding uncertainty in those areas. So what we're going to talk about today is well, what can we learn in the software world, some of the things that software experiences that are similar to what, what we see in, in uh, other businesses. So first to start with risk and uncertainty and some of the definitions that, that various uh, times you'll see relative to risk and uncertainty. Uh, the first, or, here are three different variants of uh, definitions. One was from Frank Knight who was an academic and distinguished between immeasurable, called risk immeasurable, and uh, uncertainty was quantifiable. And what's inter you, you see this in academic publications quite often. Um, I don't quite understand how it came about or how it came to be used, but um, uh, I don't particularly la really like it because uh, I, see it, I don't see it consistent with the English language, so I'm going to try to not go that direction. Uh, the PMI, uh, generally has risk, understands that risk is there and says it can be either positive or negative risk, which is again sort of counter to uh, the English language. Uh, so when I talk about risk and uncertainty in general, I'm going to be looking at, at risk as a situation that involves exposure to danger, uh, like getting run by a bull, uh, or uncertainty is the state of being uncertain, not known or established or questionable. So that's sort of the basis that we're starting from. So since this is about risk, I called it Risky Business. Risky Business is a, uh, a takeoff on a, on a film that was made a few, I think, in the 1980s uh, with Tom Cruise. So just want to show this little short clip here. Oh, we don't have sound. Can we check sound on the, on the computer? There's a time, first thing about risk management you've got to know is when you've got too much risk. We're about to go there. So. Um, the next step. I live in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas is known for having uh, real challenges with hurricanes. And so this is a, uh, a plot, an actual plot of uh, the results of projections that uh, I think 16 or 18 different weather services had regarding a path of Hurricane Rita. Hurricane Rita had come just after Hurricane Katrina had made a significant impact in New Orleans. Uh, uh, it was a huge, huge uh, devastation in New Orleans. So. Hurricane Rita was a Category 5 hurricane at the time. So it was a serious thing because had, had it come through and, and hit uh, Houston as a Category 5, it would be, be a big issue. So the interesting thing, what do, we see, what do we know about every single one of these projections? They're going to hit? Any, anyone else have anything to say about every one of the projections? The profile changes over time. They do, each one of them does change over time. Anything else about each one of the projections? Confidence levels for each? Okay, possibly. Yeah. All right. So the answer I'm going for, um, and which is an interesting thing, because I did this for the high school kids, and I got a different answer, in it, and they were smarter than me. My answer was that all of them are wrong, because I'm going to... I mean, anyway. I'm an old guy and I, I want to be negative about it. The high schooler said, every one of them's a possibility. That's, a, that's the same answer, but a much more fun way to say it. Right? Everyone's a possibility, I say everyone's wrong. But that's the whole thing. In one sense, everyone, everything's wrong, because if we were to hold you accountable to the single projection that you had, it would actually be wrong. There's no way to be possibly right. Uh, the one thing we do know is something we can measure, and that's this, this, uh, the, the plus down there, because that's pretty accurate to be measured. Uh, and it turned out that the actual path of the hurricane wasn't like any of them. Uh, but what we also know is that the collection of estimates was actually useful because it gave us a band, something we call the cone of uncertainty. It gave us a band of where we might be concerned about uh, hurricane hitting. So again, this, this then looking at that cone of uncertainty, by looking at this over a sequence of time, we can actually see and make decisions based upon where, where we need to evacuate, perhaps. All right? And over time, eventually, it comes through. This is the same type of management of bounding of uncertainty and learning as learning through things that you can measure. Some other examples of uncertainty. I love this one, a war example. So this is a quote. 
They couldn't hit an elephant at this dist. It was the last words of General John B. Sedwick, the Union Army Civil War officer that he uttered during the Battle of Spotsylvania in 1864. He was bragging that they couldn't hit him, and they did. I played this the other day. I'm going to play it again here. I think it's really a, a brilliant description of the importance of feedback. Uh, so this is another war example here of Gordon the Guided Missile. Gordon the Guided Missile sets off in pursuit of its target. It immediately sends out signals to discover if it's on course to hit that target. And, and the signals come back. No, you are not on course, so change it up a bit and slightly to the left. And Gordon changes course as instructed, and then rational little creature that he is, he sends out another signal. Am I on course now? And back comes the answer, no. But if you adjust your present course a little bit, a little bit further up, and a little bit further to the left, then you will be. So he adjusts his course again, and sends out another request for information. And back comes the answer, no, Gordon, you still are wrong. You must come down a bit, and a foot to the right. And the guided missile, its rationality and persistence, a lesson to us all, goes on and on making mistakes, and on and on listening to the feedback, and on and on correcting its behavior in the light of that feedback, until it blows up the nasty enemy thing. <laughs> then we applaud the missile for its skill. And now if some critic says, well, it made a lot of mistakes on the way, we reply, yes, but that didn't matter, did it? It got there in the end. All its mistakes were little ones in the sense that they could be immediately corrected. And as a result of making hundreds of mistakes, eventually, the missile succeeded in avoiding the one mistake which would really have mattered, missing the target. So the movie industry, all movies, they aim to be just as, just as great as the Titanic. The Titanic was, until recently, the number one grossing film of all time, supplanted by Avatar. Um, unfortunately, most movies end up like the Titanic. 78% of films lose money. And only 6% of films that contribute to making 80% of the profit. Huge area of uncertainty. I think this is an industry that doesn't necessarily know how to manage uncertainty because it's so driven by egos and, and everything else, because I don't think it's necessarily uh, the most profitable industry overall. But there are other industries that are able to, to manage, manage risk and be effectively very profitable. Uh, book industry is a good example. This is my book. Um, but so yeah, this is an example. In, th uh, in 2004, out of 300,000 books that were printed or that were available for sale, uh, less than 25% sold more than 100 copies. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Uh, poker, any poker players here? Texas Hold'em? Um, a few, a few here. All right. Yeah. So just go with me here. These are three different possible hands. Which of these three hands do you think would be the best Texas Hold'em whole hand? All right. Would you think it would be the ace four, the pair of threes, or the six nine? How many for A? You don't have to know a lot here, just a couple of A's. How many, how many for B? Maybe more for B. Um, how many for C? A couple more for C. All right. Well, if it was just those two cards and you were going to stop, you know, obviously the pair would be the highest. Uh, let's see what it has. 29.6% chance of winning. Ah, uh, the Ace 4 has a 33.5% chance of winning. And what looks like a really crappy hand, the 6-9, actually has a 36.5% chance of winning. What's going on here? What's going on, in this case with poker, that your strength of your hand going into, a, into this is largely de de determined by your weakest card, your weakest second card. So the stronger the weak card is, the better your chance of winning. We don't think that way. I'd like you to think about it also on your team. How much of your team's success is driven by your weakest link? We tend to focus on strengths. We tend to forget about what we need to do to bring our weakest links up, right? Sometimes you can bring your weakest link up and make a huge difference. Again on poker, 
I'm thinking of creating a metric for poker called percent of hands won. You think percent of hands won would be a good metric for poker success? How many think it's a good metric for poker success? Percent of hands won. What's that? What's Might not tell, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, good point. Very good point there. Um, what I was going to say, though, it turns out that this is pretty good metric. It's a pretty good metric for determining if you're going to lose. Because the more hands you won, the more likely you're going to lose. Why is that? Well, the more money you're likely to lose. Why do you think that is? You're playing too much. Yeah. In order to win hands, what do you have to do? In order to win hands a lot, it would be normally, this is what you're saying, it would normally be the same odds for across the board. That would be if everyone stays in the, in the hands all the time. But in order to win, you have to well, win at a higher percentage, it means you have to stay in the game longer. Really, really good poker players know one thing, when to get out. Right? Think about that with your software. Do you know when to get out? Are you playing a losing hand all the way to the end? Something to think about. Are you, right, are you looking for the right metrics? I mean, I compare this one often to on-time delivery. Does on-time delivery really matter? Or does it really matter how much value you deliver? What's your focus? Oil and gas exploration, something that's near and dear to my heart. What do you think the success rate is for oil and, uh, new frontier oil and gas exploration? High success, any ideas? Less than 1%, 2%, 10%? Yeah, so it's, it's about 90 to 80% failure, 10 to 20% success rate. 90% um, failure if you're using competitors' software and data, 80% if you're using IHS data. You know, that's <laughs> We make a big difference, so, yeah. and products we produce. So. Uh, oil and gas also has a lot of safety issues. It was my beginning to think it wasn't such a good idea to turn off those unit tests. <laughs> You've all heard about the big uh, uh, blowout that uh, BP had in the Gulf of Mexico. I'm sure, I mean, certainly we heard about it, and I think probably everyone heard around, around the world. It was huge. Um, actually, the company I was with, Halliburton, was uh, involved with it. I'm not speaking from any inside information, but basically, I mean, it was effectively a uh, decision by the engineers to turn off some unit tests that resulted in the big explosion. They did some tests. They didn't quite get the results that they wanted. They decided they weren't going to run the second test, and they weren't going to run the follow-up test that would have actually caught the issue, and they would have known about it, and they would have been able to shut down so that they didn't have the explosion. So. It's in software, it's an issue. Sometimes everywhere we go, testing is a big thing, unit testing is a good thing, and, behave, and, and listening to, to those tests is, is important. Um, one of the things we do in oil and gas is use something called a tornado plot. Uh, in other industries, you see this. So I'm going to introduce this idea of a tornado plot. And what you're, really, what you're looking at here is a plot that shows where, what are the uncertainties that are really important. So this is net present value that we're, we're showing. And the base case is the, is the vertical line there. So we're saying it's, it's uh, 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 1,350 million is the base case. And then what we plot is this tornado that shows where is the uncertainty. So the big uncertainty in this is in the amount of reserves in the, in the ground, uh, which could take our, our valuation way down to, to possibly only 300 million or it could take us up into a much larger amount. Uh, next down, we have oil and gas prices, and then there's uncertainty. And then down at the final, uh, at the bottom there is drilling cost, okay? Now, we, this is one of those things where, it's, where you often have the uh, measurement inversion. What do we do? Well, we focus on cost sometimes, right? It's not that important. What really matters is, is what's, what's the, uh, the big picture. So what would an intelligent oil company do with this? They'd say, well, this is my size and my uncertainty. What could I do? To, to understand my uncertainty better. So like with reserves, maybe I could get a little bit more data about it. Maybe I could do some more seismic exploration. Maybe I do some, uh, 
some preliminary drilling to find out and quantify a little bit better what our reserves are so that I can better understand the amount of uncertainty and make informed decisions based on that. So now I'm going to go into some risk management tools associated with that. In particular, um, the one particular uh, flavor of this that, that I like uh, and I've worked with Chris, Mat Chris Matz and Olaf Masson on uh, is real options. And the idea behind real options uh, is that it's the right but not the obligation to undertake a certain action prior to an expiry date. Very simple concept. You have the right to do something, but you don't actually have to do it, and at some point that right will expire, and you no longer can do it. Okay? One very simple example of, of a uh, real option is an airline ticket. Okay? I buy an airline ticket, doesn't actually... Don't even think about whether it's a refundable ticket or a non-refundable ticket because that gets into a secondary issue. Let's just say I'm going to buy a ticket. And given I've got that ticket, I now have a right to board the plane. Okay? They can't take that away from me because I've got that right to board the plane. Now, there's other issues associated with it if they're not going to fly and things like that. But basically, I have a right to board the plane. They can't make me get on that plane. Right? If I don't want to get on the plane, I don't have to. So I've got a right to do it but I don't have to do it, and at some point the plane's going to fly away and my option to get on that plane has expired. Very simple, simple concept. Most tickets, almost all tickets, operate as a form of, of a real option. And if you want to look at it from the perspective of refundable, non-refundable ticket, what you actually have is an option on an option. You have the option to get for the, for the ticket, you also have the option to refund it, and uh, so you have the option on the option. Now, there are types of tickets that aren't real options. Anyone have an idea of a ticket that's not a real option? What's that? Yeah. Speeding ticket, parking ticket, not necessarily options. Okay. All right. So real options are the right but not the obligation to some, take some action prior to an expiry date. Um, Chris and Olaf have simplified this into three, uh, three bite-sized pieces um, that I'm going to expose here. Uh, first of all, options have value. There's a value to having that option. Options will expire at some point. And key one, you never commit early unless you know why. So it's all about, the, you know, there's a decision you can make or you can commit. And, you, and the commitment actually uh, expires the option. So you don't want to do that unless you know why. But if you know why, you may very well want to commit early. I'm going to take a different spin on this, but first we're going to look at options from the perspective of options, decisions, and commitments. So options are the, the things, that, that those options that are available to you. From that, you can make decisions. Decisions don't necessarily expire the option. You can make decisions but their decision is generally, the idea, the difference between decision and commitment is decisions are reversible, okay? So you still have the option, it's just you've happened to go down a particular decision path, and you actually want to be able to do that. What you want to make sure you don't do is commit early unless you know why, because once you make the commitment, you've expired the option, the value of that option has disappeared, so you've made that commitment. The commitment might be the right answer, but you obviously want to know why you made that commitment if you're going to do it. So we could look at this as an example here. Someone's going to uh, run and jump off a cliff. At the beginning, they have an option. They have the option of jumping off the cliff or not. Then they've made a decision, a decision to start forward. At some point, they've committed. And in this case, it's probably committed pretty early. Okay? But this, there's, this is the idea of, at some point, there's a commitment at which point you can't go back. So given that framework of real options, there's four particular areas that I want to call out and put it in a different context. First of all is the value of uncertainty. Second, value of information. Third is the value of flexibility. And the fourth is the cost of delay. So the first point is the value of uncertainty. And this guy Patrick Leach, an author Patrick Leach, 
a book called Why Can't You Just Give Me a Number? I love that title, Why Can't You Just Give Me a Number? Because it's something we, we face all the time. As a very provocative question, what's the source of all value? He, asks, he teaches a lot. He's asked this of all, of his, all of his classes. And he never comes around to people giving him the answer that he's looking for. And, and it does, it's not really a surprise that he doesn't get it. Okay? He gets the standard answers, you know, creating, converting inputs to outputs, meeting customer problems, all of those things. All of those things are things which, uh, you know, very, very uh, truly do contribute to, to value. What he's really trying to get to, what's the source of all value, though, is the fact Uncertainty has to be present for value to be created. There has to be uncertainty, because if there's not uncertainty, eventually, if you have a competitive advantage and you're, you're, or you're doing something and you're building value, it'll be arbitraged away because everyone else will come in and eventually it'll be risk-free. So the fact that there's uncertainty is the source of value. And this is actually um, shown out also in, in Black-Scholes. Black-Scholes turns out to be not a very good way of looking at real options. It turns out to be a great way, a, a pretty good way for pricing financial options. But one of the key things from it uh, is, a, is there's a volatility number, a V number, a volatility. And that volatility is an indication of how great the uncertainty is. And the larger the uncertainty, the higher the, the price, so the higher the value. So uncertainty, the amount of uncertainty has a direct input in, indicator of, of uh, the amount of value. This is also shown in, in is a uh, risk reward, risk return chart here. And typically, this is the best you can do. You know, that, that efficient frontier is the best you can do. At a high, a high risk, you're going to get a higher return. And that curve is, is a fairly uh, well-defined curve. You can have something under, under the, uh, uh, the efficient frontier, which means you've got a high risk and not getting as much return as you possibly could be getting. But you generally can't go to the left of that curve. Now, if you try to, the, key, the thing I want to pull out of here is the value of certainty is that if you're going to reduce the risk, you're typically also going to reduce the return. So I'm going to go through an example here using a tornado example and just saying, you know, we're looking at this and we've seen this, this chart here and we say, so our, our um, example here, product acceptance uncertainty, how well we're going to do in the market, that's our huge uncertainty. Uh, we've got some schedule uncertainty, we've got some... Uh, general market uncertainty, and, and maybe we've got some cost uncertainty. And we look at that, and there's some negative numbers there. And we say, you know what? We'd really like to do some things to, to reduce our uncertainty, and we're going to eliminate those red bars, OK? So very simply, management says, OK, let's remove those red bars, OK? So we no longer have the low end. Well, what's really happened in the, in, in the, uh, the system? We can probably do that. But the result is going to be we're going to chop away all the high end. So yes, we can reduce uncertainty, but reducing uncertainty has actually reduced